Hello, dear ones, it's Alice. I thought I'd read uh, Shakespeare's Sonnet 116 today. It's very famous. Uh, the first line is, Let me not to the marriage of true minds. And it has to do with constancy in love, uh, beyond appearances, and into the depths of, of truth in a relationship. So I've always liked this one very much. And you'll excuse me, I have to read it. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds, or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no, it is an ever fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark whose worth's unknown, although his height be taken. Love's not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. If this be error, and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever loved. <sighs> well, here's a commentary. I will entitle it, Shakespeare the Man and Not the Myth. So, What's this poem about, really? What's the... What gave rise to this poem? <sighs> so I have my own ideas, naturally. And, and I thought I'd share them with you. Um, the first line says, Let me not... Or the first two lines, the first sentence says, Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Now, so, the speaker, which may be the author or might be someone that he wrote this poem for, the speaker of the poem is, is not the person who's married, right? He's saying he doesn't want to get in the way of marriage of true minds. So, this person, that probably Shakespeare, who wrote the poem, has made uh, advances to a lady who holds her marriage in very high esteem. And this letter that he's writing, this sonnet, this beautiful sonnet, is his way of apologizing for what he's done. So, speaking from her point of view now, he says, Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds, or bends with the remover to remove. Now, so, he may have chanced upon a lady whose husband loved her once, but whose looks are not as fresh as they were when they were first married. And he's now speaking about that husband. He's saying that if her husband does not love her now, because her looks have changed, then his love is not true. So, I gather from this that this sonnet, first it apologizes, and then it attempts to to ingratiate, I'd say, uh, by, by holding this husband of this, this lady who remains constant up to some um, standard of, of improvement. Okay? You following me? I don't know if you'll ever find anybody else who agrees with this translation, but I like it very much. This this like uh, 
uh, explanation. Now, um, love is not love which alters when it alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. Could it be that this husband has removed himself from the, from the wife and she refuses to remove herself from that, uh, from that vow that she took? Bends with the remover to remove. And then he goes on, he says, Oh no, it, this love, is an ever-fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. And this is a nautical term. At least one of the explanations I've read says this is a nautical term. It could be a reference to the pole star that navigators of those times used to to cross the oceans with, to know where they were. Because the pole star in relationship to that hemisphere never changes position, so they could use it. They had an instrument they could use to measure and judge where they were. Um, and that, that, that thought is carried out by the next uh, two lines, which have a double meaning. A, uh, there's a double entendre there. And these lines are love, that's what he means by it. It is the star to every wandering bark. A bark is a boat. Whose worth's unknown, although his height be taken. So, there's your pole star. And the boat is wandering on the ocean. And uh, the mariner uses the pole star to... takes the height of the pole star with his instrument but never knows what the star truly is, you know. Takes the height of the star, but never truly knows it. And so there's your, your navigational reference, but there's another meaning here. Um, every wandering bark, let's say it's Shakespeare. I mean, he did write quite a few love poems, did he not? Maybe he was a man about town, or as much so as possible, insofar as possible. And uh, so he's the wandering bark. He's the wandering boat, whose worth's unknown, although his height be taken. Well, he might have been a tall man, don't you think? And it could be that this behavior of his, this wandering behavior, eye that he had, It's something that he doesn't think is such a good thing. Or maybe the lady doesn't think it's such a good thing. And maybe these two lines are just his attempt to, to speak lowly of himself, to hold himself in lower esteem so that she'll think more highly of him. It's possible. Maybe this poem is um, a second attempt. <laughs> Let's see. So now, let's say, he might be thinking he can step in there where the husband is failing. So he says, love's not time's fool. Though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. So, maybe she doesn't look quite as fresh. But love's not like that. Maybe he's the man to provide it. So maybe he had, in the next few lines, he, he attempts to draw her feeling about how love should be constant into his own understanding of, of how love might be. Now, this might not be his understanding, but he's still trying to, like, row with the lady in the same direction. These two lines are like when two horses are running in the field in slightly uh, different directions. And then they turn together, they wheel together and, and begin to run side by side in the same direction. That's the intention of these two verses. They're what you might call the true, an attempt 
to turn the, the lady of his affection to the true marriage of the minds he has in mind. Of course, it's quite likely it's not minds he's thinking about. Ha ha ha!